इसमें कौन सा वाला स्लाइड है आपका सर पीडीएफ है या ये वाला हाँ ये वाला जो भी स्क्रीन में आएगा तो दिखना चाहिए ना अच्छा ये दरवाजे में ना थोड़ा सा बंद कर देना क्योंकि दूसरे कोई एंट्री कर देता है ठीक है धीरे-धीरे आ रहा है बस चलो वो भी आएगा हाँ भी आएगा पर ये दूसरा क्या हुआ सेल्युलर प्लांट से दिखा रहा है ये क्या हुआ Can you see the renin system which I displayed over here? The renin angiotensin system. अच्छा लड़के उसने गलत कुछ ये गलत कर दिया। इसमें तो दिखा रहा हूँ। ये section बच्चे आ गए हैं सभी। section आ गया ना? ठीक है। Okay, wonderful. So good morning. Today we are going to start with uh, a new class, and the class is actually. On the steroids by the fetal maternal unit or the fetal placental units. So we are going to go to that class, but before we go over there, I just want to complete this portion, the renin angiotensin system, the RAS system, popularly known as, which we kind of missed in our previous class. And I don't want to leave this one out because this is extremely important and even more important in the present COVID-19 situation and the COVID-19 pandemic crisis. So this system is extremely crucial and therefore I just want to focus first on this one because this has been left over in the previous class, we couldn't get in enough time and after this we are actually going to this fetal placental units and I'm hopefully I'm going to cover everything today. I'm going to be a little fast so just you know post your feedback, the things are not clear and then I, you know we can again revisit those things. Okay, so this is the renin angiotensin systems. You could add a component to that and sometimes people say that renin angiotensin aldosterone system because this system also integrates with the aldosterone which is the hormone which has been released from the adrenal cortex which you had seen in the previous class and therefore this entire system is this RAS system, this renin angiotensin aldosterone system. So today we are not going to talk too much about that aldosterone because we already discussed about that in the previous class. So today we are going to focus mostly on this renin angiotensin system. So what is renin? It's a hormone. It's a kind of a hormone, definitely, because it has been produced by the kidneys and it has a capacity to bind to the renin receptor. So there is something called the renin receptors are there. So it's a kind of a legitimate hormone. So it has been produced by the kidneys and there are specific regions in the kidneys which is known as the juxtaglomerular apparatus which produces this renin. And there is another region in the kidney which is known as the macula cells or the macula densa. They also produces renin. They also stimulates the macula densa to produce the renin. So, so the renin can be produced by these juxtaglomerular cells by by two different mechanisms. The first mechanism is that there is an inherent stimulation of those juxtaglomerular cells of the kidneys to produce renin. Why stimulations? I'm going to talk to this in a second. And the other stimulation is going to come from the macula cells or the macula densa. And both of these two signals can contribute to the synthesis of the renin by the just glomerular cells. Now renin release is still been stimulated under these three conditions. One is there is a decrease in the arterial pressures or there is a decrease in the blood volumes or there is a hypovolumia which can be because of this dehydration or hemorrhage or you know there is a blood loss. And the third is hyponatremia. Okay. So the thing is that if the renin release is actually been there, so the renin is going to be released only when the system encounters these three particular scenarios or these three particular crises you could call up. 
so whenever there is a decrease in the blood volume so whenever there is an less in the circulation volume or circulatory volume then this system gets activated and what happens is that there is a less perfusion in the kidney obviously because the blood volume is less so there is less perfusion through the kidneys and the and the macula system so the macula dense which I was talking a little bit back actually senses sodium ions or tonicity and they starts firing and then actually activates the macu the juxtaglomerular cells to release renin and even the juxtaglomerular cells has baroreceptors the the pressure sensing receptors so they are also getting activated so they are, they will start firing once the baroreceptors has, are that gets stimulated and they get stimulated because there is a low of the perfusion and less perfusion through the renal arteries or kidneys. So whenever there is a decrease in the blood volume, then this baroreceptors which has been present in the juxtaglomerular cells starts producing renin. That is a very important hormone. And this renin, I'm going to skip this one, has this function is that it converts a very important enzyme which is known as angiotensinogen and this converts this angiotensinogen to angiotensin. I'm going to see this one in a couple of slides. So this is primarily the, the a PPT, a PowerPoint presentation, which tells you the different drugs and the different pharmaceutical agents, which kind of integrate with the systems and is going to inhibit a different regions of the systems. And that has a lot of implication in management of hypertension and the blood pressure. And very obvious because you know, this system actually regulates the blood volume this system also regulates how much the blood vessels are going to constrict and therefore blood volume and the vascular constrictions which actually leads to an increase in the peripheral resistance. All of this actually contributes to hypertension or the regulations of these blood pressures. And therefore this particular system, this renin angiotensin system is a fantastic axis for pharm pharmacological interventions by different classes of drugs. We are going to talk about that again in a little while. So what this slide says that there are drugs and these drugs actually comes in different categories. Again, we are going to talk very soon about what are these. They comes in two different categories primarily. One is known as ACE inhibitors, which is angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors. So what is that angiotensin converting in enzyme inhibitors? Okay, let me pull up these slides and then we can actually go back to this one again. So this is what I was talking a little back that there is an angiotensinogen, a very big protein which is actually synthesized in the liver and that is been present in the circulations. Now whenever there is a decrease in the perfusion of the renal arteries or kidneys or whenever there is an activation of the baroreceptor systems which starts firing then they releases this renin by the juxtaglomerular apparatus or juxtaglomerular complex which includes the juxtaglomerular cells of the kidneys and the macula cells and then they starts producing renin. The juxtaglomerular cells starts producing renin and this renin is also known as angiotensinogenase because it converts angiotensinogen to angiotensin 1. Now once angiotensin 1 is actually been formed, then the same enzyme also can convert angiotensin 1 to angiotensin 2. And which enzyme is over here? This enzyme is very crucial. This enzyme is known as angiotensin converting enzyme. Now this angiotensin converting enzyme is also known as ACE or ACE for short. And this ACE inhibitors are actually one of the billion dollar industries because a lot of pharmaceutical drugs are actually the, the pharmaceutical drugs which ends in prills, enaprils, captoprils, those groups of drugs actually inhibits this particular enzyme that converts angiotensin 1 to angiotensin 2. So again, kind going recapitulating this one, so angiotensinogen converting converted into angiotensin 1 by renin, which has been released by the macula as well as the juxtaglomerular cells. And this angiotensin 1 is converted into angiotensin 2 by angiotensin converting enzymes. Over here, this is a converting enzyme. Okay. Now once angiotensin 2 is actually been produced, it has two different fates or it has multiple fates actually. We are going to talk all of these fates now. This angiotensin 2 itself is a potent vasoactive substance. What does that mean is that it has the capacity to act on the blood vessel smooth muscle and cause the construction of the smooth muscles. And therefore, there is a decrease in the diameter of those blood vessels which in turn actually increases the peripheral resistance and thereby can increase the blood pressure. That exactly is we say that it can cause vasoconstriction, which is again because of the reason that this can act on the smooth muscles of the blood vessels. And as a result of this one, this can increase the peripheral resistance and thereby can autocorrect the blood pressures. So whenever there is a 
blood pressure has been less a hypovolemia because of this hypovolemia there is a blood pressure which has been less this system gets activated okay now angiotensin 2 which is we just not discussed has several fates one of the fate is this the other fate is that this angiotensin 2 is also a very potent stimulator for aldosterone the one which we had discussed in the previous class this angiotensin 2 can activate the adrenal cortex and can actually release aldosterone and again we had seen in the previous class what the aldosterone does is that it actually causes the increased sodium and water retentions right and as a result of this slimmer this is different from this ADH because ADH only causes water retentions to the aquaporins and aldosterone causes water as well as sodium retention so both of the two things so this angiotensin 2 can activate these aldosterone systems can cause sodium and water retentions and as a result of this again the volume actually increases so this is the two different fate of this angiotensin 2 which is actually been produced which is which has been produced as a result of this pathway now this angiotensin 2 it's very important is that this actually interacts with this receptor that is known as AT1 receptors it has actually two receptors AT1 and AT2 receptors now this if angiotensin 2 is over here this has also been acted by another enzyme that is known as ACE2 which is angiotensin converting enzyme type 2 and what it does is that it converts this angiotensin 2 to something called ANG17 which is angiotensin 1 to 7 peptide now that has an extremely strong relevance to today's coronavirus crisis because this angiotensin converting enzyme type 2 or ACE2 which is again a membrane bound receptor that converts this angiotensin 2 to ANG17 is also a receptor for this coronavirus entry. Now what I'm going to do is that I'm going to pull quickly just two slides and I'm going to show you what I'm uh, trying to tell. Okay, so let me bring this one slides over here and pull up this one. So this is what I'm trying to say is that this is angiotensinogen converted by renin to angiotensin 1 and this angiotensin 1 has been converted into angiotensin 2 by angiotensin converting enzymes or ACE. Sometimes it's also known as angiotensin converting enzyme 1. That's a nomenclature. I mean people use different nomenclature in the books. We can't help it. It's not mine. But just to avoid confusion, just re remember that ACE or ACE1 is exactly the same enzyme. It converts angiotensin 1 to angiotensin 2. Now once angiotensin 2 is actually informed, we have seen that it can actually interact with this receptor which is angiotensin 1 receptor. And once it interacts with this receptor, what it does is that it causes an increase in the synthesis of pro-inflammatory cytokines, it causes fibrosis, it causes pulmonary edemas, and it has so many other functions related to the symptoms which we see in coronavirus infections, that is ARDS or acute, re acute respiratory distress syndrome. Now, in in the absence of this particular process, there is another thing that actually goes on simultaneously because once AT2 or angiotensin 2 is actually informed, this angiotensin 2, again I am just trying to summarize that this angiotensin 2 has a potent action on these blood vessels that it actually increases blood pressure, the causing the constriction of the blood vessels, right? And this is mediated by these AT1 receptors where angiotensin 2 binds. Now angiotensin 2 can also be acted by another enzyme that is known as ACE2 which is angiotensin converting enzyme 2. This is converting enzyme 1. Now this angiotensin converting enzyme 2 converts AT2, angiotensin 2 into AT17 which is a small peptide. Now surprisingly this angiotensin 17 has a function which is absolutely contradictory to the functions of this AT2. So whereas AT2 actually increases pro-inflammatory cytokines, AT17 actually causes anti-inflammation or produces an anti-inflammatory environment. Whereas AT2 produces an hypertension because it causes the constriction of the blood vessels, this causes a relaxation of the blood, blood vessels and at the same time this is much more much more important molecules to maintain homeostasis because this actually counteracts all the functions of AT2 so AT2 has this antagonist which has been produced by ACE2 which is angiotensin converting enzyme 2 to produce this particular molecules which has which has a completely opposite role than what the function of this AT2 now over here if you see the next portion of the, the lower panel over here there is something called the SARS coronavirus, the SARS-CoV-2, which is the crisis causing pathogen for this coronavirus pandemic now. What, what it does is that it actually utilizes this angiotensin converting enzyme type 2 receptors and can gain entry within the cells. In fact, there is another protease which, is, which participates in this process that is known as TMPRSS2. So TMPRSS2, which is not shown in this figure, so TMPRSS2 with angiotensin converting enzyme 2, S2, 
are forming the viral entry receptors and through which the virus actually enters into the cells in the pulmonary or the lung epithelial okay now over here in the left side if you just see there are two things which shows an inhibition this is known as the ACE inhibitors I was talking a little back about the ACE inhibitors which are the prills all the kind of prills are the ACE inhibitors the captoprils the lamoprils and all this kind of the 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 pharmaceutical agents which ends in prills are all the ACE1 inhibitors which prevents the conversion of angiotensin 1 to angiotensin 2 and if this in if this conversion is been prevented obviously all these functions of this angiotensin 2 which is mediated by AT1 receptor cannot be executed and therefore there will be no correction of the blood volume and there will be no vasoconstrictions and as a result of this these agents or ACE inhibitors are very potent in trying to regulate the blood pressure so they are anti-hypertensive drugs right because of the reason they counteract the function of this angiotensin 2 because it prevents this conversions now there is another group of the drugs that is known as which ends in turn that is known as losartans this this groups of drugs this is known as angiotensin receptor blockers what that does is that they prevents the binding of this angiotensin 2 this culprit molecules so far if you can name it as culprit molecules this it prevents the binding of this angiotensin 2 to its receptor so ARBs actually prevents the losartans and other groups of drugs they prevent the binding of angiotensin 2 to its receptor and angiotensin converting enzyme prevents the conversion of this angiotensin 1 to angiotensin 2 so that this is not been formed now conceptually or if you ask me that which one is the better agent to control blood pressures it has been found that you know angiotensin it has been found that this ARBs or angiotensin receptor blockers are found to be superior in preventing the anti in, in kind of preventing the hypertensive effects of these pathways as compared to the other the ACE inhibitor. The reason being is that there are few non ACE1 path pathways also that can convert angiotensin 1 to angiotensin 2. In other in other words, you need not necessarily de be dependent on angiotensin converting enzyme type 1 to convert angiotensin 1 to angiotensin 2. There are other ancillary pathways that produces angiotensin 2 from angiotensin 1. And therefore, if your individual has been solely dependent on angiotensin converting enzyme, they may not achieve a complete remission or complete cure of the disease because either way angiotensin 2 is been produced even if you inhibit this particular pathway by some, some other pathways, by ancillary pathways. Again, I think I should have a slide to show that one. But ARBs are much superior because whatever the way angiotensin 2 is been produced, either way it actually prevents its binding to its receptors and therefore these are a little more potent in their function as an anti-hypertensive drugs as compared to that of the ACE inhibitors. Okay, and this is the slide that actually shows the, how the coronavirus actually enters into the cells. This is the same thing that it actually goes and undergoes endocytosis and over here this is the ACE1 and ACE2 receptors and mostly the ACE2 receptors, this angiotensin converting enzyme 2 receptors and also in cell surface molecules that is known as TMP or SS2 that goes and, and integrates together and helps into the entry of the virus. We are not going to go into anything of this detail, just showing that eventually the virus, what it does is that it actually activates these particular systems and produces interferon alpha and interferon gamma and that actually produces a tremendous amount of what you call as a cytokine storm or inflammatory cytokine storm. And this is the one which is the real killer because this is the one that actually brings down the patients tremendously. When the patient actually experiences in the systemic circulation, lots and lots of interference which has been produced because the body actually tries to produce the interference because it tries to prevent the virus so that the virus does not multiply and the virus can be irradiated and can but the what what happens over here is that the same cytokines which has been produced by the body to contain the virus are the one that actually been causing collateral damage and causing what you call as a cytokine storm and bringing out the detrimental effect of this particular so this is the this is the this is one of the reason why we have we, we what what is the reason for the pathology of this coronavirus infections okay we are not going to talk about this one much so this is not something which was of our focus for today's discussions i'm going to bring up this system again and talk about this okay so this is what i was talking about that's uh, this angiotensin from the renin pathways okay now this is another pathway which is actually works opposite to that one again contradictory to this pathway which is known as the high molecular weight kininogens and calicranes which actually produces bradykinins and this bradykinins unlike angiotensin 2 which causes vasoconstrictions 
this bradykinase actually causes vasodilation and their function is actually decrease in the blood pressure here this actually increase in the blood pressure so that is something actually opposite now again this is something which we already discussed and let me just quickly bring the name of those drugs the so ace inhibitors are actually these drugs which i mentioned that they ends in prills so this is captoprils ramiprils fosinoprils standoprils all these prills are all ace one inhibitors which prevents the conversion of this angiotensin 1 to angiotensin 2 and then we talked about the angiotensin receptor blockers which are a little more superior in trying to control the hypertension are losartans and valsartans and all this kind of drugs which actually ends into ans or tans tans okay okay <coughs> so these are the drugs which convert prevents angiotensin converting enzyme the ace1 inhibitors okay so this is something again we had already seen so i'm just going to rush this one and bring to this slide which is the angiotensin 1 receptors now remember i just mentioned and in fact we had actually kind of discussed in the previous classes that once the angiotensin 2 once the angiotensin 1 is actually been formed then actually it gets converted into angiotensin 2 by the angiotensin converting enzyme this one and this angiotensin 2 can bind to the receptors and this receptors name a little confusing the receptors name is angiotensin 181 receptors okay so even though it's not 81 it's actually angiotensin 2 but the receptors are actually named as 81 so don't get confused with this 81 as angiotensin 1 because we don't have angiotensin 1 now it's already been converted into angiotensin 2 angiotensin 2 binds to this 81 and 82 receptors but these are the receptors for the angiotensin 2 not of the angiotensin 1 now we had mentioned just now that angiotensin 2 has an vasoconstriction e effects right and in biology whenever you see the any kind of constrictions any kind of force then it it has to be mediated by calcium signaling and that is exactly what happens is that this angiotensin 2 that is 82 actually binds to 81 receptor which is in gpc or which is g protein coupled receptors and causes the release of calcium by phospholipid c pathways and this calcium is the one that actually causes the vasoconstrictions there is angiotensin 2 receptors 80 which is 82 receptors again note not to confuse these are all the receptors for angiotensin 2 okay again this is a gpcr which is a g protein coupled receptors but it does not activate the calcium signaling pathways and then you have the 83 receptors so basically angiotensin this guy angiotensin 2 can work can act on three different receptors type 1 receptors producing calcium and vasoconstriction the type 2 receptors not producing calciums and a different functions and we have the type 3 receptors which is a little unexplored so majority of the function of this angiotensin 2 is mediated by the type 1 receptor which is a calcium signaling pathways okay don't have to remember anything beyond that that should be sufficient and then we also talked about that if this guy is been left over this has been acted by s2 which is angiotensin converting enzyme type 2 and that produces angiotensin 1 and 7 so just try to you know kind of read it because it's a little confusing but again we don't want to confuse you with this one this is something what i was talking a little back that we have this angiotensinogen converting into angiotensin by renin then ace converts angiotensin 1 to angiotensin 2 and then angiotensin 2 binds to this angiotensin 2 receptors and these two receptor angiotensin and angiotensin 2 receptors are known as 81 82 and 83 right now this is what i was start talking a little back that there is something a non ace pathway also that converts angiotensin 1 to angiotensin 2 so no matter even if you use an ace inhibitors like those captoprils and enoprils even then angiotensin 1 is going to convert into angiotensin 2 by some amount because there are non ace pathways and therefore ace inhibitors are not complete solution to rectify blood pressures right because of the reason that there is a leakiness of this pathway it can go by shunt pathway and produces angiotensin 2 whereas angiotensin receptor blockers are a little more superior because they in fact prevents the binding of this angiotensin 2 to its receptor so they had a much much robust function in regulating the blood pressures okay this is known as aobs which is angiotensin receptor blockers we are not talking too much about it so i'm going to pass on the slides just this actually tells you that how this how these drugs arbs are also important in trying to increase trying to you know uh, improve the situation of diabetic individuals who are who have a proteinuria or also in the cases of general proteinuria because of the reason that this arbs actually dramatically improves the renal functions because of the reason that they kind of has a profound influence on this water and fluid balance so they had a profound influence on this on this renal functions okay so that is very important additional actions of this angiotensin receptor blockers okay 
this is something what I was talking a little back that what is hypertension? I think you must have, most of you know it very well that this is actually a product of peripheral resistance and cardiac outputs and the angiotensin 2 system what it does is that it causes the vasoconstrictions and therefore it increases the peripheral resistance. The other important thing over here is that this angiotensin systems can also activate and goes into the hypothalamus and activates the thrust centers or the centers that actually stimulates us to drink water and therefore that is another way in which it can actually act to kind of manage the blood volume not just by causing the water reabsorption sodium reabsorption but also by promoting the thrust center so that we actually go into more into a water drinking mode okay this is another mechanism of by how the, how the system works now we are not going to too much into this because this is not something which is right in this today's class so this is the one which i actually kind of wanted to co you know cover in the previous class which you could not do so before we kind of exit from this discussions and go into the fetal placental unit i'm just going to do in one minute re recapitulations of whatever we had actually discussed so we discussed about the renin angiotensin aldosterone system this system is a fantastic system which is known as renin and aldosterone renin angiotensin aldosterone axis which is a fantastic system because it actually helps in the regulation of the blood pressures so whenever there is a hypovolemia whenever there is a decrease in the blood volume because of the blood loss hemorrhages any kind of a shock then what happens is that this decrease in the blood volume actually causes an activation of the systems because now there is a low perfusion into the kidneys the kidneys the renal arteries are actually receiving less of the blood flow this actually activates the macular denser systems as well as the juxtaglomerular systems and both of these two systems actually stimulates the juxtaglomerular apparatus or the juxtaglomerular systems to release an important hormone which is known as renin. Now what the renin does is that it converts the angiotensinogen which is produced in the liver to convert to form angiotensin 1. Now once angiotensin 1 is actually been formed then quickly it has been actually acted by another enzyme that is known as angiotensin converting enzyme and what the converting enzyme does is that it actually converts angiotensin 1 to angiotensin 2. Now once the angiotensin 2 is actually form it is a very important molecule because what it does is that it actually causes the constriction of the smooth muscle cells near the blood vessels and therefore can increase the peripheral resistance and thereby can increase the blood pressure that is exactly why the system kicked in in the first place because there is a low of the blood pressure so this system actually activates or gets activated to to rectify that lower blood pressures and actually increases the blood pressures in addition to that angiotensin 2 is also a very strong potent activator of this aldosterone release from this adrenal cortex and therefore the aldosterone is also been released and this aldosterone what it does is that it actually causes sodium reabsorptions, water reabsorptions and as a result of this again there is a volume correction so this system actually kicks, kicks in whenever there is a low perfusion or so whenever there is a decrease in the blood volume okay why we had actually focused also so much in, in today's time because i told you that this angiotensin converting enzyme whenever they actually act so just to bring pull up the slides again this this system this angiotensin 2 which is so formed can also be acted by another enzyme that is known as the ACE2 which is angiotensin converting enzyme type 2 which converts this into a substance that is known as angiotensin 1,7 now this angiotensin 1,7 has an action which is dramatically opposite to that of the angiotensin 2 because this one causes increase in the blood pressure but angiotensin 1,7 actually causes decrease in the blood pressure it's a vasodilator these days why we are more interested into S2 because this angiotensin converting enzyme type 2 which is not shown in the picture is also in co-receptors for the coronavirus entry and therefore people are actually debating that whether they should not take hypertensive drugs or antihypertensive drugs in this case of coronavirus infections because if you have an antihypertensive drug then there is an upregulation of the expression of this S2 and as a result of this S2 upregulation possibly there is more of the viral entry but then you know there is a fantastic article which has been published in Lancet in just this month and that talks about this one and says that well this is a complete myth so if you are suffering from hypertension if you are, su if you are suffering from diabetes don't withheld these medications because of this fear that you know there is an angiotensin converting enzyme type 2 receptors are there which is upregulated and that actually will promote the virus entry before that actually this is going to produce even more serious consequences just because we are withdrawing this drug because of the reason that now you are actually withdrawing this drug and therefore the angiotensin converting enzyme type 2 uh, or S2 cannot form ANG17 and therefore the, we are losing the protective action of this ANG17 if you are withholding this drug and therefore it has been said that don't withhold this drug with the fear of coronavirus but rather consult with the physicians and then take in 
actual decision what you are what you need to do okay so this is the summary of this one and we are we are actually exiting from this and i'm pulling up the slides for the today's class which is supposed to be today's class you know the pto placental unit so let me bring in this one again i'm going to toggle with two different slides to bring it up and we are trying to see if we could actually kind of wrap up everything into this class okay so we have another half an hour to go and uh, let's start with a little shift in the gear from this allosteron systems to the hormones of this of this fetal placental units okay as a student you need to supposed to know and supposed to define what do you mean by fetal placental units what is the placenta how the placenta is the should be informed what are the functions of this placenta how it is still important for embryo development how it is important for the embryo survival and what are the hormones which is been produced by the placenta so that are the that is kind of the learning needs for this particular class okay i'm pretty sure that you have you must have dealt a lot with the placenta and the trophoblast systems in your embryology classes and anatomy classes so we are not going to go too detail into that so even if you have slides we are going to move very fast because i am assuming that most of you has already encountered this placental systems in your anatomy and your embryology classes okay this is the this is the picture of a human matured placenta at term what does it mean that after 30 week, 39 weeks or 40 weeks of pregnancy when the baby is been delivered then it also comes out with this transient organ which is known as placenta and that's the umbilical cord over there through which the baby is been actually attached and this is the placenta which has been kept in an upside down conditions and if you could see over there these are the different septas or we call them as a cotyledons all of these cotyledons are actually very important for the maintenance of the placental functions okay and the mature placenta actually weighs not too much because it just weigh about about roughly about 700 grams 800 grams extreme conditions you could see about 1 and 1.5 kg but mostly the median weight is about 500 to 600 grams okay now this is an anatomical you know if you take in cross sections of this one this is how it looks like this is the placental villus systems which you must have encountered already in your embryology classes and how this villus systems of the placenta is very crucial because it actually maintains a efficient fetal placental or fetal maternal exchange of the gases and the nutrients is very important because if it doesn't happens then all the gases and the nut on the waste materials which has been accumulating in the developing fetus is going to produce toxicity is going to cause fetal demise and therefore there should be an eff efficient systems to salvage out those waste products from the fetal components and to provide fetus with the nourishment and the nutrition from the maternal systems and this is exactly what the placenta does and the functional units of the placenta as the functional units of the kidneys and nephrons the functional units of the brains are the neurons the functional unit of the placenta is the trophoblast cells which are very important cells of the diverse functions they are also in stem cell like functions and they helps in this proper exchange of this maternal to fetus gas as a nutrition on the nutrient exchange these trophoblast cells are very crucial so this is what we are talking about the learning need this is an electron microscopic image of how the trophoblast and the placental villus system actually looks under extremely high magnifications you could see that it has been actually been branching and sub branching and again further branching the entire process of this multiple and numerous branching is to produce a large surface area so that an efficient exchange of gas and the nutrition can take place why we are bringing all of these things together because this part of the fetal placental unit so we are talking about fetal placental unit from a biochemical point of view you need to consider also the anatomical and the physiological point of view so that you actually study all of them together in one in a consolidated form rather than to just study the biochemical aspect and then not correlating with the actual phenotype of this placenta so that's the reason we are actually just walking through it even though we are not going into too much detail about this so the villus tree actually branches repeatedly and much more repeatedly so that they can form a mesh and com complex network of finger like projections this this actually helps in the efficient exchange of the gases and nutrition between the fetal and the maternal components then this is an image that actually shows how the placenta is actually been attached to the fetus over here through the umbilical cord okay you must have seen this image numerous times in your anatomy and this other classes i'm not going to talk about this one this is the one which i was trying to put to your attention is that this is the umbilical cord and this is the placental structures and from here this is what is the placental villus right the finger like projections which i was talking again and again now this finger like projections actually comes in very close proximity to the maternal blood vessels so much close proximity that there is almost like a single cell cell layer distance now at that close proximity the exchange actually can take place very efficiently the exchange of the gases by diffusion can take place because you know the diffusion is a thing 
where the exchange can take place, but it is a function of the distance. If the distance is too much, then the diffusion quickly dies off. So one of the very important factors for diffusions to happen between two different surfaces is their close physical proximity. And that is exactly what is happening is that there is a very close proximity between this placental villi trophoblast cells and the maternal blood vessels. They come in almost physical contact with each other and that actually helps in the exchange of these gases from this maternal to the fetal components, the oxygen, and from the fetal to the maternal components, the carbon dioxide and all the oxygen and all the waste products. Okay. That is what has been shown in the schematic diagram. This is actually image of this thing. You could see that how closely this placental villus complex, which is actually shown in this is a white color, is actually been integrating with the maternal blood vessel, which is been shown over in the red color, right? So they come into physical, very close physical contact so that the efficiency of the diffusion can be maximized and efficient exchange of the gases and the nutrition can take place between the fetal and the maternal components. That's the whole purpose of this close proximity. So when you take out the placenta, you could see that they are actually attached with each other, physically adhered with each other. Okay. This is the structure of this umbilical cord. This is one artery, two veins, and then actually drains into this, and then this is the villa structures. Again, we don't want to talk about this one too much. Again, we are just going to skip this one because this is something which you have actually discussed and seen in your subsequent class. I'm just, you know, kind of these images are all from the embryology books. So we are not over here to discuss too much detail about it. I'm just going to pull up the slides which is relevant for today's class. Now in this trophoblast cells, there is two types of cells. One is the trophoblast stem cells, which is highly proliferating, highly multiplying, highly stem cell in its nature. And this is known as the cytotrophoblast, which are unicellular cells or cells with only one nuclei. Why it's relevant? I'm going to bring it just because this cytotrophoblast has the capacity to fuse. So two cytotrophoblasts can fuse and then form a giant cells. And the third trophoblast cells can fuse to this giant cell to form another giant cells. And slowly they form a big giant structure that is known as syncytia trophoblast or the syncytium. Now this syncytium is very important because what the syncytium is a way in which the trophoblast cells can actually increase the surface area. So if you think about one trophoblast cells, it has just a tiny surface area. Now if it forms a large sheet-like structure because of this capacity to fuse and forms a labyrinthine sheet-like structures, then that actually increases the surface area and has better capacity to exchange gas and the nutrition. That exactly what happens is the cytotrophoblast actually fuses to form syncytia trophoblast and that syncytia trophoblast is the one that actually causes the exchange of the gases. That's the one, syncytia trophoblast. A part of the cytotrophoblast, because I had just mentioned that these are the trophoblast stem cells, they are stemness in them, they have the stem cell capacities, they are in high proliferative index, they are in extremely high capacity to multiply and they are at the, at the peak of the cell cycles because they are rapidly proliferating. Now these cells have the capacity, they are also known as pseudo-malignant cells because these cells have the capacity to invade into the maternal endometrium as a part of what you call as an extra villus trophoblast and causes a remodeling of the maternal blood vessels so that the maternal blood can actually gush towards the fetus. Because what is happening is that the, there's a fetal component, there's a maternal component. How does the maternal component even know that the fetus component needs the nourishment in the form of the maternal blood? Well, this has been brought about by the help of these extra villus trophoblast cells which is one of the differentiated lineage of the cytotrophoblast stem cell. And this extra villus trophoblast cells, what it does is that it actually causes the remodeling of the maternal blood vessels so that the blood vessels can actually become a little leaky and a lot of blood can actually flow and can actually nourish the developing fetus. Again, you are going to see a lot of this one in your anatomy and this embryology classes. So you are going to go quickly into this one and then bring up the one which is little relevant for today's class. So these are all anatomy stuff. I'm just quickly skipping this one. Okay, I'm just going to bring up the slides where we're trying to focus on the crosstalk between the fetal component and the maternal component. So the whole crux of today's class is how the fetal components of the developing fetus integrates and crosstalks and co co coordinates with the maternal components. Now, as such, they cannot do it so easily. But they do it with the help of this intravenous structure or intervening structure, which is known as the placenta. So what the placenta does is that it actually helps in mediating this crosstalk. So think about the placenta as a third party which actually helps him to bring the maternal components and the fetal components together so that they can actually help in efficient crosstalk. How we are going to see a couple of examples. So what happens during the pregnancy, there is an increased demand of the glucose by the fetus. So what the fetus or the fetal component does is that it actually alters the metabolism of the maternal components. So in the fetal components, the fetal cells or the placental cells or the trophoblast cells to be very precise, they actually release a hormone that is known as placental lactogen, also known as human chorionic somatomyomotropin, 
They might not confuse you with human gonadotropin, gonadotrop which is HCG. That is a different hormone. You are going to see that hormone also. But we are not talking about HCG over here, which is human chorionic gonadotropin. We are talking about human human chorionic somatomamotropin, also known as placental lactogen. This hormone actually functions opposite to that of the function of the insulin. So insulin actually causes hypoglycemia because it allows the entry of the glucose within the cells. This hormone it prevents the entry of the glucose within the cells. And this is in produced with the fetal components into the maternal systems. So the maternal glucose utilization is been severely compromised because this hormone prevents the glucose utilization. It has an anti-insulin function. And this surplus glucose which cannot be utilized with the maternal components just by the mass actions it actually gets drifted across the fetal placental unit to the fetus. So the fetus is actually been or the embryo developing embryo is actually been ensuring that it has an adequate supply of this nutrition in the form of the glucose because it produces a glucose intolerance status in the mother with the release of this human chorionic somatomamotropin which actually causes the diversion of this maternal glucose because of its underutilization in the maternal systems towards the fetal components, right? Because of the reason that this actually hormone is very crucial to provide the nutrition to the fetal components, okay? That is human placental lactogen. Now the fetus also needs a large amount of fatty acids because of the reason that fatty acids actually has a structural role, has a functional role and again majority of the fatty acids which is transported from the fetal components towards the maternal components are the palmitic acids and this palmitic acid is actually been synthesized by the maternal component, the fetal component cannot synthesize it efficiently and this has been diverted from the maternal towards the fetal components and helps in the membrane building functions and all of the synthetic functions related to the availability of the fatty acids. Again, the fetal component cannot efficiently produce this palmitic acid, so it has to depend on the maternal components to get this palmitic acid delivered to them. And then we are going to see about the amino acids and the proteins, how the maternal components actually causes the, the transfer of these amino acids from the maternal to other fetal components and these amino acids now gets transferred to the fetal components, helps in the building of the proteins and other growth and development functions. So what we are seeing, if we can summarize this one, that what you could see is that a very efficient crosstalk between the fetal and the maternal components. And this is the part of this fetal maternal systems. Now, this actually involves the diversions of these fuels, metabolic fuels, in the form of glucose, in the form of fatty acids, palmitic acids, in the form of amino acids as a building block for proteins and so forth. So that's the wonderful systems, how the two systems actually orchestrate together to control the functions. Okay. Now this is already you know that that how the fetal hemoglobin has a higher affinity for the oxygen and therefore you know the oxygen gets sequestered by the fetal hemoglobin and goes from the from the maternal components towards the fetal component. When it reaches to the fetal component, then there is a 2-3 BPG which has been produced in the metabolic pathways of the glycolysis that actually helps in the unloading of the oxygen from the fetal hemoglobin and therefore the oxygen has been efficiently delivered. Again, this is a another example of the crosstalk between the fetal and the maternal components. Okay. Now I'm going to bring up the last slide for today's class. And this is the one which we are going to spend a little time and discuss about what is going on with this one. Okay, so let me see what is this slide. <coughs> Give me one minute. So I'm going to cross this one and uh, fetal placental unit one to twelve months. Okay, so let me see if this is the one. Okay, this is the one we are going to talk today about. You know the steroids of this fetal placental unit. So in the in the other you know the slides whatever you are discussed about per se we didn't focus on the steroids but we actually focused on these important other fuels so the whole philosophy of this class is that you need to understand that how the fetal and the maternal components coordinates and cooperates among themselves so that the efficiency of these two systems can be enhanced several folds and the fetus which is developing fetus right doesn't have all the capacity of this metabolism to undertake by itself as an independent component or independent unit can coordinate with the maternal components and the placental components and can actually get the nourish nourishment and all the components it needed for its own survival. That is the whole philosophy of this fetal placental unit. Steroid hormone is just one small tiny part of this entire process. Rest of these other things are also equally important. The glucose transfer, the transfer of the fatty acids, amino acids and so forth between these two different components. The, the transfer of this oxygen also is very crucial because without that we are not going to have this chemical reaction because majority of the reactions or an or aerobic reactions, right? So you need definitely the oxygen. So we are going to go into a very important statement which I was kind of banging you again and again, you know, that the fetal components, the placenta and the mother are all been interdependent on each other, right? So this is very important. Just just kind of, you know, remember this one. You have to, you know, kind of talk to your, yourself several times 
and just put it into your brain that the fetal, the placenta, and the maternal components are interdependent on each other. So they function as one joint unit. Very important. They don't function independently. They function as one joint unit and forms what you call the fetal placental units. Okay. Now the hormones which is introduced by this are majority of the steroid hormones, the estrogen family hormones, which involves E1, E2, E3, which is estrone, estradiol or 17 beta estradiol and estrone, which is E3. Progesterone, which is very important, HCG hemochronic gonadotropin, very important. We have seen a hemochronic somatomammotropin, which is known as the human placental lactogen, also very important. So all of these hormones, are, which is pregnancy related hormones, are very crucial in mediating this particular crosstop between the fetal component and the maternal components, okay? Now over here, we cannot have a discussion unless and until we kind of give and given credit to another very important transient organ which is known as the corpus luteum. Now the corpus luteum is actually been formed when the follicle is actually been released and the remaining thing that is known as the corpus luteum, right? The corpus luteum, if there is no pregnancy, actually survives for another seven to 10 days and after that it causes what you call as the luteal death or the corpus luteum actually demise or the corpus luteum dies down. In other words, the corpus luteum is the component which has been left over after the egg is naturally been released. And if the egg is not been fertilized by sperm, then the corpus luteum does not have any function to survive and then it actually slowly dies off within 7 to 10 days. That's the whole function of the corpus luteum. But however, if the corpus luteum functions become tremendously important, if, if the egg which has been released now mates on sperm and then they form the zygote and then the development of the fetus or the embryo is actually been formed. Then the corpus luteum is one of the most crucial organ because it actually supports the pregnancy till the placenta or the placental components actually takes over the functions. So I always see corpus luteum as something like a person which is a goalkeeper, you know, kind of thing as a defense, which defends what is what the defense it produced so that before the placenta picks up its own time maturity, which takes about a couple of months, the corpus luteum actually helps the fetus to survive. In other words, if you do an if you do a corpus luteum surgery, kind of removing the corpus luteum, then no matter what happens, the pregnancy is not been supported. Because there is a gap between the placenta taking over the functions. And that gap is actually been maintained by release of progesterone by the corpus luteum. So if the corpus luteum is been not functional, then the progesterone surge which actually comes from the corpus luteum will be absent. And with the, with the absence of the progesterone, the pregnancy cannot proceed. And there will be spontaneous abortions or the death of the fetus. So corpus luteum is that important that it actually takes over the functions until the functional placenta is actually been formed. Okay. Now, it lasts for 12 days and then it actually begins its demise. That's exactly what I was talking about is just now. And this corpus luteum in order to survive actually needs the presence of an hormone which is known as luteinizing hormones. Okay. Now this is corpus luteum produces progesterone and the estrogens. And if the corpus luteum dies off, then definitely the synthesis of the estrogen, the progesterone by the corpus luteum will be prevented. And the absence of the progesterone, you just cannot have a fu functional pregnancy. The pregnancy cannot be supported. Okay. Now this is the this is how exactly the corpus luteum actually looks like. This is a real image, not an animated image. This is a real image. What is fascinating in this is that if you see the color of this corpus luteum, it is deep yellowish in color. In biology, if you see anything which is deep yellowish in color, that actually indicates that this has a lot of fatty acid synthesis and fatty acid metabolism going on because mostly the fatty acids if they are get deposited then they actually gives a yellowish coloration and that is exactly what has been seen in this corpus luteum is that it has a yellowish coloration because this is one of the most biologically active tissue which actually synthesizes a lot of different hormones and steroid biosynthesis so as to pregnancy can be supported okay until the placenta takes over the functions just to happen to show you the corpus luteum's image and this is something what you have discussed about that you know this how the how the egg is actually been released and how the corpus luteum has to be functional and if that becomes functional only if there is a fertilization so there is a fertilization by the sperm and then the corpus luteum actually survives so that the pregnancy can be supported estrogen and pregnancy progesterone during the pregnancy what is their function they had an enormous function during pregnancies you know the maternal levels of the progesterone and the estrogen increases and reaches to the concentrations which is substantially higher than that of the achieved in the normal menstrual cycles. So even in the menstrual cycles, you could always argue that, look, estrogen has also been elevated in the menstrual cycle. What's the big deal? We know that in the menstrual cycles, you know, there is different stages or there are different phases of the, the proliferative phase is there, the secretory phase is there. Over here, whatever the amount of progesterone and estrogen is actually been produced in the developing embryo, at the time of fertilization, so the female is fertile or the female is, if the egg of the female is been fertilized by the sperm and if she's pregnant and the baby is viable, then 
the amount of the estrogen in the progesterone which has been produced is several fold higher than the estrogen in the progesterone which has been produced during the time of menstrual cycle which is which is also much higher but then the amount is much more higher in the pregnancy the levels of the hormones as compared to that of the normal menstrual cycles how these elevated levels are achieved we are going to see them in a minute so early in the first trimester over here what i started talking about that in the first trimester which is about 7 to 10 weeks you know early plus early trimesters the hcg that is been manufactured by the syncytioblast rescues the corpus luteum so that the corpus luteum doesn't dies out as i mentioned the corpus luteum cannot survive too long it is in life span of about 7 to 10 days now if if the corpus luteum is not been allowed to survive between 7 to 10 days then this corpus luteum undergoes a process what is known as the luteal demise or the corpus luteum dies off and if with its death you know the progesterone and estrogen released by the corpus luteum has been compromised so there is something called the hcg which has been a corpus luteum survival factor think it in that way the hcg is to be produced because of the reason they have been seeing in the previous slide there is something called the trophoblasts and the trophoblasts actually fuses together to form syncytial trophoblasts right so, so two unicellular or single cell cytotrophoblasts fuses together by process known as trophoblast differentiation and it actually produces syncytial trophoblasts which is a multinucleated syncytium which actually helps in the efficient gas and the nutrition exchange now this fusion of this cytotrophoblast to form syncytial trophoblasts also produces a very important hormone that is known as hcg and what the hcg does is that it actually acts as a corpus luteum survival factor because even now this this syncytial trophoblast and the cytotrophoblast trophoblast are the part of this placental system but still the system is not been that robust is not been developed completely that could take over the fun entire function of synthesis of the steroid hormone so until they gets matured it is the corpus luteum which is taking care of this entire scenario so they does it by the release of hcg so hcg which is been produced by the syncytial trophoblast of the developing placenta or the immature placenta actually helps in the survival of this corpus luteum so that the corpus luteum survives and when the corpus luteum survives then it produces progesterone and estrogen for supporting the pregnancy right that is very important now this is hcg is therefore also known as the second leiotropic hormone and this is also the hormone which is also known as the corpus luteum survival factor so okay. similar to that the anterior pituitary hormones and maintains the functions of the corpus luteum up to 7 weeks after conceptions without this help of these hormones hcgs or human coronary gonadotropin the corpus luteum is going to die within about 7 to 10 days in the presence of hcg it survives and remains for a long time till the placenta is matured and within that time within that time this corpus luteum actually produces all the important luteal steroid hormones like estrogen and the progesterone okay so the, so now let's talk about 8 weeks of the gestations what happens is that this is the graph which has been very informative you could see over the graph is that on the y axis you have the corpus luteum concentrations which has been expressed in nanograms per ml and on the x axis you have the gestations right from the 2 weeks to 40 weeks which is the entire term placenta or that when the baby is actually been delivered now over here if you could see we can see that the corpus luteum actually produces the progesterone and the progesterone produced by the corpus luteum at that time no other organ is actually been helping the pregnancy to support by producing the progesterone so it's just by the corpus luteum alone contribution but eventually the corpus luteum cannot survive too long because of the reason that it has its own limited life span so before the corpus luteum dies off the function of this release of this progesterone is actually been given or shared to the placenta because by the time the placenta is matured enough to take over the functions but within this time when the placenta has not taken over the function this particular region in my cursor this particular region where the placenta is not been matured and not taken in the functions it is the it is the hcg which has been released by the syncytial trophoblast so the placenta actually acts on this corpus luteum and keep it surviving and thereby can make sure that enough amount of progesterone and the estrogen can actually been produced to support the pregnancy okay now we are talking about the placenta i am going to just focus on a very important thing is that the placenta is an imperfect organ why it's an imperfect organ because of the reason that the entire repertoire of the enzymes which is important for synthesis of all the hormones is not been present in the placenta and that actually makes it even more compelling of and even more you know important for the today's class is that because today's class is actually how these three units the placental units the fetal components and the maternal components coordinates with each other in a linear manner and actually helps each other so each of these organs if you take independently the fetal component means the developing fetus the maternal components the mom and the placenta are not been independent by themselves alone they always lack a few of these enzymes 
But together, when they act as one functional component, one functional unit, then any deficiency in one of the components is actually been supplemented by the enzymes or the substrate in the other compartments. You're going to see a lot of these examples where the placental unit may be, may be insufficient of a particular hormone or particular components, but then the maternal components or the fetal components actually delivers that and makes sure that the placental components is actually getting that in an adequate amount. So that is very important and that is what you're actually talking about. <coughs> Okay, so about this system. So I'm, I'm going to stop this one. We have also in class tomorrow, I'm going to continue this one because someone, your class monitor just now messaged me. Thanks for reminding me that we have, an, we have a physio class just now. So we are going to stop this one and we are going to continue this one in the tomorrow's class. Also tomorrow I have the same class and we are going to continue this one and finish it up. We have a couple of slides, more slides to go. Okay, so I'm going to pass on the slides to you tomorrow, not today because, you know, let me complete the class and then, you know, we can always share it and upload to you. So thank you for today's class. Thank you for your attendance. And if you have any doubts, just you know, kind of note it down and pass on to me. And I'm going to address to me to this one in my next class. Okay. Thank you. Have a nice day. Stay safe. Thank you. Mm.